All right, good morning. We're so glad you're here to join us in worship. Will you all stand up and join us in this first song? And I was lost with a broken heart You picked me up and now I'm set apart And from the ash I am born again Forever safe in the Savior's hands You are more than my words can say I follow you, Lord, for all my days I fix my eyes, follow in your ways Forever free in an ending grace Because you are, because you are, you are, you are My freedom, we lift you higher, lift you higher Christian Center. Are you glad to be here? Yes. All right. I'd rather be healed than the fi- here than the finest prison in the state. Amen. <laughs> and the finest hospital in the state. I'd rather be here. I'd rather be here than anywhere else. Well, you may be seated. I'm so glad that you're here this morning as we get started. Let me just say that if you're here as a first-time guest, welcome home. We are so glad you're here. And if you are a first-time guest, please do pick up one of the yellow Connect cards in the seat in front of you. Pick that up, fill it out, and we'll treat it as though it's money. And at the end of today's service, you'll be able to exchange that for some goodies on your way out. As well, I have something very important to do today. I believe it's always worth celebrating when we see that individuals are deepening their commitment to Christ and to the body of Christ 
as a whole. So today, I would like to present two membership certificates. Would the following individuals come and stand before the congregation? Billy Wingate and Nicole Lee Wingate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me take a moment and just read one of these. Turn and face these folks. Y'all need to get to know these people. Certificate of membership. This certifies that William or Billy Wingate has publicly confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and entered into church membership agreement with Harvest Christian Center of Cantonment, Florida on January the 19th, 2020. Praise God. Thank you both very much. Well, all right, Pastor John, it's time to leave these folks that are in a good mood. Let's come receive tithes and offerings. Amen. If you're free today, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Just got a quick announcement before we uh, lead, I lead you in our time of giving. Next week is Super Bowl Sunday. Amen. That means we are still having church on Super Bowl Sunday. Amen. And also, we're going to have prayer uh, at 5 o'clock on Super Bowl Sunday. I want to encourage you all to come out for prayer, but at 5.30, we will have a Super Bowl party next door in our, uh, our youth facility next door. So I want you to encourage you all to come out for prayer. You can pray for your favorite team, uh, pray for the bets you didn't make, and then we can go over there and watch the Super Bowl together and come and have some uh, fun fellowship and get to know each other on first name basis and uh, do a little trash talking, amen? All right, so I uh, want to encourage you to come out. We're calling it Super Bowl, but uh, we, were, we want everyone to, if you come, to bring a can of soup for our, our food bank for a donation. And so bring a can of soup or a thing of food and come out and just have some fun fellowship. If you just uh, stay with us uh, uh, half the game to halftime, just come out and fellowship with us. Amen? Amen. It is... It is uh, as we transition our offering time, our offering scripture is Malachi 3.10, and it reads, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, and try me now in this, said the Lord of hosts. If I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there won't be room enough to receive it. Amen. Try me now in this. Uh, I'm kind of excited about our series, a decade series that's going on. They're going to be talking today about the 80s. Amen. Anybody was in high school in the 80s? Anybody besides me? I was in high school in the 80s. I graduated in 88. And my favorite artist, recording artist, rap artist, was his name was LL Cool J. For you people that watch uh, uh, NCIS, he, I think he's playing on NCIS as Sam Hanna. But uh, he had a song out in 88 called I Need Love. And I will remember going up for our, our graduation rehearsal, and I remember singing that to the whole school. <laughs> <laughs> but what is interesting about LL Cool J, he came out and started singing in 84. And now is 2020. He's still doing uh, great things. He, I think he had 12 albums. He's been in 20 movies. He's been uh, nominated for Grammys. And he's actually in NCIS. And uh, so that's been 36 years. And a Christian magazine came to him and asked him, uh, how you think, why do you think you've been on top for so long and your career been so successful? He said, well, he said, I've been a lifelong tither. He said, I started tithing when I was a young child. And he said, I tithed all the way through my career. And I seen where other people that started when I started, they, they, their career start crumbling. He said, but I seen the hand of God on my career, how he blessed me, gave me favor through all of these years. And he says, it's because of, I kept God first and I tithed on everything I have. I gave God 10%. And uh, I just want to encourage you. As the scripture says, now try me in this. Amen. Try me in this. If you're not a tither, you can't afford not to tithe. 
I, I have a powerful testimony about tithing, but I want to encourage you, if you haven't started tithing, try it for three months. Try to tithe for three months and then look at your finances and see how God has blessed you. And I, I have no doubt that God, uh, he will keep his word and he will bless you, your finances, your household, give you favor on your job. He opened up doors that no man can open, amen, through the giving of tithe. Amen. Let us, let us pray. Father, we just truly thank you for this opportunity to give. This opportunity to bring your tithe and your offering into the storehouse. That we, that we may be provisions in your house. Provisions to bless the people of God. Provisions to upkeep the house of God. Provisions to get the materials and things in place to preach the word of God to your people. Lord, we thank you for all the faithful givers. We thank you for those that desire to give that don't have. Lord, we thank you for those that will try you in this, this day, starting today. Lord, we ask you to rebuke the devourer for their sake. Amen. And allow the fruits of the ground and everything they put their hand to the pl prosper. And Lord, as we enter into this worship of giving, this worship of praise this morning, Lord, we pray that your presence come down. Abide with us. Direct this service. Lord, touch a heart that's hard today. Lord, we just thank you for what you're about to do. And we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. And once that passes, you can stand up to continue to join us in worship. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who 
can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord? So let's sing it out. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord
and I will rest in your promises and my confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest I'm gonna clear this out in your promises and my confidence is your faithfulness and I will your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises and my Was bought with a 
morning we just worship you God we bow down before you I ask that this morning you would just speak to us we ask together Lord that you will move in our lives this morning God we pray that whenever we leave here we are changed for your glory God we love you we thank you and we worship you in Jesus name If you tuned into the radio in 1979, you might have heard this hit single. It was released by an artist who would know worldly success without measure. 
And one of the reasons that it's without measure is because our world does not really understand the definition of enough. This hit that Michael Jackson produced and sang in 79 led to his first Grammy Award. You know that our world eventually gave him the nickname of the King of Pop. I'm glad to report to you today that he is not the king. When it was time for him to take his last breath, he had to face a holy and just God who's full of grace and mercy just like all of us will. But as I thought about that hit in 79, that song, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, is kind of like the song that ushered us from the late 70s and that era of you can go your own way, selfishness, into the excess of the 80s where, man, we just didn't know what enough was. We just never could we get enough. It was just always more and more and more. How many of you actually remember the 80s? Anybody grow up in the 80s? You, you listen to the radio in the 80s? Well, some other music in the 1980s that you might have heard, you don't have to confess that you enjoyed it. You can just say, to them, you know, I, I know about that song. Well, there was this group called Journey, and they kind of encouraged us in the faith. They said, don't stop believing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you know, they were really Christian or not, but they encouraged us to keep, you know, believing. And, and then there was this other group by the name of Bon Jovi, and they said, hey, man, we're just living on a prayer. <laughs> Anybody still living on a prayer? <laughs> I, I don't know how in the world some of us get so excited because they say, they took prayer out of schools. Listen, as long as there's tests in schools, there will be prayer in schools. There will be kids uh, sending up Hail Mary prayers, uh, you know. <laughs> So we know that we need to pray, and most of us here would readily confess that we're still living on a prayer, as the lead singer John Bon Jovi said. But I will remind you that just recently, like within the last decade, he also sang a very important song that all of us at Harvest should know. He said, who says you can't go home? Welcome home. Not only do we have living on a prayer and don't stop believing, but then Whitney Houston began to sing to us and tell us about the greatest love of all. And then there was this individual by the name of Billy Joel who insisted we didn't start the fire. <laughs> Somebody started the fire, but we didn't start the fire. <laughs> If you watched the movies during the 80s, you may have seen a couple of these flicks, Back to the Future. Let me just see how hip you are on movie trivia. What date did he have to set the tr car to in order to go back to the future? <laughs> All right, you can tell me on the way out if you think you know your correct answer. And then there was this movie where this fellow had to phone home. It was called... Okay, so you did see that one, and you're not ashamed to admit it. You, you watched E.T. Well, if you were watching TV at home, you would have watched some of the uh, really still famous sitcoms by the name of Family Ties with Michael Keaton. And then, of course, you might have watched The Cosby Show. Anybody remember The Cosby Show? I mean, The Cosby Show was a good flick. I was watching that every week. Uh, I love little Theo Huxtable. Just in case you wonder what happened to Theo, I found out that he's working at a hospital in Atlanta on another TV show. <laughs> or maybe you were so hip and you learned how to dress sporty because you were watching Miami Vice. You were really into Crockett and Tubbs. You know, I tried watching that again, not recently, just too recently, um, just a few weeks ago. And, and I looked at it and I thought, man, this looks cheesy. I can't believe I ever really liked that. You know, it's like, wow, that was then, this is now. But who can forget the fashion of the 80s? You saw the young lady uh, as she was getting dressed, and the fashion of the 80s was something else. Some of you young ladies probably remember that the style then for your hair was to tease it high to the sky. The bigger, the better. You know, we're going to meet Jesus, but first with our hair. <laughs> and then that was also the decade when young women started putting shoulder pads in their blouses, in their tops. So there's the high hair, the, their shoulder pads. We're trying to get closer to heaven, right? But women and men, everybody fell in love with bright colors. You know, the neon, flashing colors. We like those bright colors. And then, I bet some of you ladies even still have some. Y'all got your leg warmers? <laughs> it might be time to let the leg warmers go. 
young men wanted to sport and wear a members only jacket. Remember the members only brand? That jacket. Now, then there was the dreaded parachute pants. <laughs> I had a pair of parachute pants. <laughs> I can still remember the sound they make as you walked. <laughs> as the nylon fabric is rubbing against itself. Well, that was also the era that I learned that a kid could ruthlessly be judged by the style of kicks that he wore. You might have wore Reeboks, you might have wore Converse, but in our hearts, we all know that you wanted to wear my Adidas with fat laces. <laughs> my Adidas with fat laces is what we were looking to wear because that's what made you hip. That's what made you cool. Well, the 80s were also filled with its own decade of crises and big time events that made all of history. Some of you will remember the miracle on ice. The miracle on ice, of course, is what we give the name to that famous time in which the underdog Americans beat the Russian hockey team. Then we come to the crisis of AIDS. None of us even understood what AIDS was, but it became a big common household thing that we understand now all about AIDS. It became a horrible crisis during the 80s on live TV. In 1986, while in school, I remember watching the Space Shuttle Challenger break apart in the sky, killing all seven of its crew members. And then in 1987, I remember this speech, and I heard President Ronald Reagan stand and emphatically declare, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. <laughs> well, to our downfall, the 80s, really became obsessed with the lifestyles of the rich and famous. We thought those were our idols, those were our role models, those were the people that we needed to really go after. The 80s became a time where everybody wanted more, more, more. I'm going to get what's mine. If I want it, I should be able to have it. And the people that already had it, they had this saying, if you've got it, flaunt it. And then the classic bumper sticker that you see on everybody's car in the 80s was this, he who has the most toys wins. We were obsessed. We kept trying to find all we could to get more, more, and then more. Well, see, it's almost as though the answer to enough was a heavily guarded secret. But I've got good news for you this morning. God's Word has an answer to us uh, that we don't have to worry about, is this a secret? We can find out what the answer to enough is when we go into the Scriptures. Now, you might already know the answer. Some of you not, not, might not really understand the question. Dr. Seuss said this one time. He said, sometimes the questions are complicated and the answers are simple. The reality is this morning we all need to be reminded of the truth that we're going to find in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. And here we find the secret to enough is really found in Christ. Philippians chapter 4 is where I'm reading my text from this morning. Verses 10 through 13, as you will see on the board. And I think I'll just look up there and read along with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Can you say that phrase with me this morning? To be content. One more time. To be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today we find that in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle, Pi is, Apostle Paul is actually writing to the church in Philippi. And here as he's writing to the Philippian believers, he's thanking them for her care for him while he's in prison. Now, he don't let them fully off the hook because he goes through this progression. He remembers now, at the beginning, you supported me and you did good. Even when I was like in Macedonia and had to leave, but somehow I fell off your radar and you stopped supporting me. But now, 
now it's like you found me again. And I thank God that you found me and your care for me has been renewed as you're flourishing and you're giving. Here's something you need to be reminded of. It is more blessed to give than to receive, but if you're on the receiving end of the giving, then you need to make sure that you pause and thank God that you're on the receiving end. Thank God for the blessings that you're enjoying. Amen? Amen. So here we find that Paul is the one who's introduced them to the gospel. If you've read the book of Acts, you find that he is the one that went to the city of Philippi and preached the gospel. This is how that church got founded. Therefore, they did indeed, under the divine obligation, owe the apostle Paul a great debt of gratitude. And the best way they could show their gratitude was to give and help support this in the, in the jail for the gospel jailbird. And therefore, they're supporting him, and he's grateful. But we also discover in this passage that Paul learned something very important. He says, I have learned to be content. Now see, that means that if, if he learned to be content, that it's not some supernatural thing that's unattainable for the rest of us. It means that it's really just a skill that you and I can learn. It's a learned skill. And as a Christian, you need to learn contentment. Here's what I understand when I look at the 20s that we're already into. I don't know if they'll be the roaring 20s or not. But very few Christians actually seem to be content. We don't really have a great grasp of contentment. Friend, we need to get to the point where we understand Jesus is really all we need. Yeah, but I need this and I need that. Listen, you don't have any needs in your life that's any greater than the need of Jesus Christ. And if you have Jesus, I promise you, you have all you need. And He's promised to supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus if you will learn contentment. I want to try to help us to understand what this contentment really is because it starts on the launch pad of trust. We, we got to understand what it really means to trust God because you can't be content if you can't trust God. And that's going to take us to a new level of faith. We got to have more faith in God in order to rest in the supernatural power of contentment. Here's the sermon in a sentence. The abundant life of faith leads to supernatural contentment. But just because I use the word supernatural there doesn't mean it's not yours. You can have contentment. The abundant life of faith leads to supernatural contentment. So let's talk about what contentment is and what it's not. First of all, I want to tell you this morning, contentment means being patient, not complacent. How many of you like patience, though? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody here feel like you got enough patience? Well, you notice my hands aren't raised either, right? <laughs> I mean, I want it. I want what's mine. And as one commercial said, and I want it now. <laughs> it's my money and I want it now, was what the fella said. But the reality is, friend, if you're going to be a servant of God and you're going to exist successfully in this world, you better learn how to be patient and wait on the Lord. Listen to me, child of God. Wait upon the Lord, and he shall renew your strength. So contentment means pay, being patient, not complacent. But this godly contentment that I'm trying to teach you about this morning does not mean that you have just got that nonchalant attitude of que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. It does not mean that you've got this attitude that's always okay with the status quo. That's not what I'm talking about, and this is not what the Bible is teaching us about contentment. Listen, it is not ungodly to have a little bit of ambition, to have a dream for having more or being more than what you are today. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you as a child of God, man, you need to filter your hopes, your dreams, your ambitions through God's Word and through the place of prayer and get yourself a God-sized vision for your life. That's okay. But you cannot follow the ways of this world and go into what we would describe as the rat race, the dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world where you're just trampling all over everybody and everything to get what you want because it's what you want. Listen, child of God, if you will cooperate with God's plan, He will make you bigger and He will make you more than what you are today. But you must filter your ambitions and your dreams through the Word of God, the will of God, the place of prayer. I know this by experience Listen, we go into the Word of God in Proverbs 21, 5, and we read, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. So what I'm saying is if you make some plans, you, you're praying, you, you're
you've read the Word of God and you've got a God-shaped vision for your life, well, listen, you listening close? Just because you've got a God-shaped vision don't mean you get to sit back and cross your arms. Okay, God, do it. That's complacency. It's up to you now. I believe you. Friends, sometimes you're going to have to get up off your lethargic posterior and get to work. <laughs> if you've got a God-shaped vision and a God-shaped plan for your life, you, you might want to go to work tomorrow morning. Am I, am I talking to the men all right? Can y'all hear me, men? Listen, y'all understand what I'm talking about? You don't get God's best in your life because you're lazy. <laughs> you got to, like, get up and go to work. Sorry, I didn't create the plan, but that's what I discovered. I spent the first few years of my livelihood trying to earn a living, being mad at Adam, being mad about sin, being mad when I had to get up and be in an iron foundry before 5 o'clock in the morning. I thought, this is just not right. This must be the definition of cruel and unusual punishment. But what I found out is that was part of God's plan for my life, for me to get up and go to work. Sometimes you just got to get up and go to work if you really want to have more in your life. Contentment means being patient, though, not complacent. Sometimes we just want to sit around and ignore the fact that we do have responsibilities. Let me just brag on our volunteers for a minute and the staff that gets here. And You know, you, you come early to church on Sundays. Some of you come early on Wednesdays and you're looking to do whatever you can to help the kingdom of God expand through our volunteer efforts. Listen, that's just because you understand as a servant of God, we've got responsibilities and we must fulfill our responsibilities as servants of God. Therefore, I'm telling you, as a child of God, you are responsible to live out your faith and serve others, not just yourself. The simplest way to become a small person and not have anything at the end of your life is to make sure all you're ever concerned about is yourself. And if you live a life of selfishness, I promise you, at the end of that life, all you'll have is yourself, and you'll be disgruntled. You'll be what the, what the definition of is a malcontent. You'll be discontented living in a state of a malcontent. You'll be grumpy. You'll be old. You'll hate life. I don't like people. I stay to myself. That's not the will of God for us. The will of God for us is to learn how to live the abundant life of faith that leads to supernatural contentment. You can have contentment. Look to your neighbor this morning, help a preacher out, tell him you can have contentment. You can have contentment, and you can, and you can too. You can all have contentment. It don't mean that you're complacent, okay? <sighs> Feels free when you tell somebody the truth. Did you hear it too? If nobody told you, then just tell yourself, Self, I know that's you. Uh, self, you can have contentment too. Some of you specialize in talking to yourselves. So I'm just trying to help you say the right stuff. Secondly, I want to tell you this morning that contentment creates opportunities for God to work. Contentment creates opportunities for God to work. You see, we get to a point in our lives and we feel like, ain't nothing happening. Well, I just told you about exercising patience, right? Got, got to be paid, got to slow, slow your roll. Give God the space and the time to work in your life. Let me put this in the setting of being a parent. Anybody ever told a child, I'm going to do this, I'm going to take care of this for you. I got this. But then the child comes to you like every day. Oh, what about them? What about? And you didn't have, well, you said you was going to do that. Child, chill out. I wonder if God the Father has ever looked down from his throne and told me, child of God, you got to just chill. I'm working on your behalf. But if you don't learn the lessons in the meantime, you'll never really be able to enjoy the blessings. See, what I learned as a father, sometimes I just a little bit mean. But the longer I delayed and the longer I made the child wait on the big blessing, the more they really appreciated the big blessing when it finally come their way. What, y'all ain't never heard of Christmas? <laughs> I just want to make sure you're still with me. Look, listen to J.B. Phillips' translation of verses 10 and 11 of Philippians 4, which we've already read from the New King James. But I want to show it to you from the J.B. Phillips. It says, It has been a great joy to me that after all this time you have shown such interest in my welfare. I don't mean that you had forgotten me, but up till now you had no opportunity of expressing your concern. Nor do I mean that I have been in actual need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances may be. You see, a lot of us are blaming our circumstances. 
We're saying, oh, because this is going on, this is why I'm like this. This is why I'm wound up so tight. This is why I'm so stressed out. It's all about these circumstances. Well, welcome to life. Everybody deals with some stressful circumstances, right? It don't matter what stage or what age of life you're in, there's always going to be some circumstances that can possibly cause you some stress. But can I tell you, stress and circumstances are not the reason for your lack of contentment. I would venture to say this morning that if you are not walking in the supernatural power of contentment, you've not fully learned to trust God. You can worship Him a little bit, but you don't really trust Him Monday through Friday. You don't really say, God, I, I know that it's all in your hands. and Lord, I'm just waiting on you. Well, listen, the Apostle Paul had to learn how to deal with some of this stuff. What are you talking about? Well, he's a jailbird. Remember, he's been arrested for preaching the gospel and he's locked up. He's at the mercy of Rome. And, and, and we get to this one place in Philippians chapter 4 where the guy that's in prison is telling the believers in the city of Philippi, be anxious for nothing. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Be, don't worry about it. You can trust God. How did he get to that point? He had learned contempt. You see, by this stage of the time of writing of this letter, the Apostle Paul had learned how to release his fears and worries. He had already processed them in the presence of God over and over and over again. He finally just came to the conclusion, you know what? My life is God's. It don't matter really what happens. I can trust God. And when he released it into the hands of God and had faith in God, he began to learn the supernatural power of contentment. Therefore, he can tell those on the outside, you know, you really ain't got to worry about nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, this is about contentment. But contentment, when you really begin to experience it, creates some opportunities for God to work. When you finally just chill and realize, I can trust God, and you sit back and say, all right, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I, God, I thank you for what I've got. Thank you, I've got a place to lay my head. Thank you, I've got a car to drive to work tomorrow. I thank, And you thank God for everything you got, and you just begin to relax and trust God. What you're actually doing in the spiritual realm is you're opening up opportunities. You're making space for God to work on your behalf. You see, once Paul got to this place, all of a sudden, the light clicked in the mind of the leadership of the Philippian church, and they began to understand, hey, we forgot about Paul. we got to start doing our part to take care of the apostle. You know, he's the one that brought us the gospel. I mean, we owe the salvation of our own souls to the apostle Paul who preached the message. Therefore, we got to, what happened? As soon as Paul got to the supernatural power of contentment, God caused the light switch to come on into the hearts and minds. You see, when you begin to learn how to trust God and you walk in the supernatural power of contentment, what you're doing is you're creating an opportunity for God to work on your behalf. Now, this wanderers, anybody like me, you get to that season of contentment, you're like, I don't know what you're going to do, God, but I just need you to move. And you finally just get, I'm going to trust you, Lord. I, I thank you, God, for what I have. Lord, I, I, I leave it in your hands, Lord. I'm, I'm just going to wait and see what you're going to do. And then all of a sudden, as though you forgot to pray about a certain need, you forgot to think about something, and then, bam, God said, here you go. Told you I was going to take care of that, didn't I? Oh, praise God that he knows how to be just on time. But this requires a level of faith that you and I oftentimes forget that we need to walk in. You've got to have faith in God. Faith ain't going to line up with your feelings. Somebody say amen. It's like, I didn't feel it at all. Preacher, I didn't feel what you were preaching this morning. I, mean, I couldn't even get into the worship. I didn't, didn't feel right to me. You know? Well, maybe your feelers broke. You know, you can't live your life based on feelings. I mean, because I promise you, if you've got to be at work early tomorrow, you're going to probably get in the morning and say, you know what, I don't feel like it. <laughs> Anybody? Teenagers, you ain't going to feel like going to school tomorrow. No, you're going to wake up and say, I ain't feeling it. Well, guess what? You still got an obligation to go. What I'm trying to tell you is that you need to forget the feeling matters. Feelings ain't going to always line up, but your faith tells you what to do. By faith, you can trust God. We're called to live by faith and not by sight, not by smell, not by any of our feelings or senses. We're called to live by faith. And if you'll trust God, I'm going to tell you, you'll get to this place of contentment, and it creates opportunities for God to work on your behalf. But thirdly, this morning, I want to tell you, contentment cultivates divine strength. You see, the practice of contentment eventually leads you to a place 
that you accept that God is there to help me in all circumstances. Just because I'm having a bad day or the circumstances are rotten doesn't mean that God has forsaken or abandoned me. It means that God is here and i got to look for evidences of His supernatural intervention. Therefore, with patient trust in God, and you're looking for seeing how is he going to do this? How is he going to work it out? Lord, I'm looking to you every day. Oh, I don't know what to do no more. And you get to this place of contentment, and you begin to understand, you know what? I can do this one day at a time. I can. As a matter of fact, I've come to this conclusion. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, that's the revelation you get to in the lifestyle of supernatural contentment. Now, don't lift this verse of Scripture so far out of context that it means stupid stuff. Okay? You're not going to be able to, like, you know, jump off the top of the Empire State Building because you believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was like an exaggeration, but a lot of people might take it and they lift it out of context and they want to make it to mean something that doesn't. What it really needs to be done is interpreted in the contextualization of contentment. If I really am walking in the contentment that's found in Jesus Christ, I will understand then I can do all. Anybody ever tell yourself, I can't do this no more? Anybody had a breakdown lately? You know, emotionally you're a wreck and you have this breakdown and you just tell God, you scream, I can't do it no more. I can't do this. Am I the only one that's ever been there? Just, just wave your hand a little bit at me. Just make me think you're still with me. Okay, so you've been there before and you tell, I can't do it no more. You know what really happens? You have failed to trust God. You think because your life is shattered and it's a mess that God ain't on his throne no more. Somehow God failed you. I know you'd never say that. You're too religious to say something like that. But that's the way you're acting. When you had this meltdown and you begin to scream and cry, I can't do this no more. And it never really was about you could do anyway. <laughs> How can I do all things? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, apart from Him, you can do nothing. That's what Jesus says about the supernatural walk with Christ. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But with God. All things are possible. You don't know how many days of my life I've gotten up not knowing what to do. But you know what I do when I don't know what to do? I put one foot in front of the other. Lord, I'm going to work off the same plan that you gave me yesterday since you ain't giving me no new orders. You got anything new? Okay, I'm going to do the same thing I was doing yesterday, and I'm going to walk by faith. And, I, and by the way, God, I'm waiting to see how you're going to fix that because, you know, you're supposed to be taking care of me. And I talk to God like that. I do. Lord, I'm looking for your supernatural intervention because you said you were the God that would always work on my behalf. And I've learned to trust God regardless of my feelings and my emotions day by day by day. I promise he can be trusted. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And so here's the supernatural way to get to this contentment that I'm talking about. It's very simple. You've got to lean hard. Lean to the point where you're almost falling down. Lean. Come on, lean in your chair right quick. Come on. I, I got to make the point. You got to help me. You lean hard. But what you're doing is you're leaning into Christ. And, and lean so hard that it's okay if you do fall down. Anybody ever fail? I fell yesterday. I was outside doing some landscaping. Scared to mess of me because the last time I fell, I fell 12 feet, okay? I was on my own two feet trying to do some landscape, and next thing you know, something that I'm trying to jerk up out of a flower bed finally comes up, and, and I had a flashback for just a moment. I'm like, oh, oh, that was a short fall. I'm okay. <laughs> you know what? It's okay if you fall down. It really is. It's okay if you blow it. It's okay if you have that emotional meltdown that I was talking to you about. Because you know what? If, if a righteous man falls and you're in Christ, guess what? You've fallen on the rock. It's okay if you fall on the rock, baby. You've got a sure foundation and you just get up. Yeah. Though I fall, yet will I stand. Why? Because Jesus is with me and Jesus is for me. And in his strength, I can do all things. By His strength, I can live in contentment and I can trust in a God. Listen, I, I know this world is telling us still the same old lies of the 80s. More. you got to have more. It's the American dream. Listen, man, unless your house is 3,000 square feet, you ain't really doing it right. 
And there are even some preachers that have tried to propagate and tell the Bible does not endorse the American dream. Sorry. What we've been taught through pop culture, and you got to go hard after everything. We've been taught about a relentless pursuit after money and the things of this world. Possessions, materialism. That's not the secret to success in life. If you really want to know how to find the contentment that I've been talking to you about today, it's found in a relentless pursuit of Christ. If you abide in this word, in Christ if you like make the in between of these pages like where you live and you talk to the Lord every day then you'll find there will be something strange otherworldly to start to happen to you even when life has fallen apart circumstances look a wreck you'll be like it's okay he's with me and he's taking care of me I'll trust him even if that was the wrong key, I'll trust him, right? I'll keep going. <laughs> See, I know some of us. We get distracted by, you know what, and, and let's, in some churches, unless the preacher, unless the, the lead musician plays the right key, we can't even worship. Oh, well, Ryan, some of y'all, you need to worship Jesus before the music starts. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to play your own music. Sometimes I'll have to sing my own song, sing my own hymn, and begin to worship the Lord and remind myself, Self, I know that's you. You're doubting God again. But you can trust Him. If you would stand with me this morning, I want to try to bring this to a close. The same stuff of excess that began in the 90s, began in the 80s, then took us on into the 90s, I still think that so much of America is trusting in the stock market. We're trusting in a presidential administration. Listen, if there's one thing that American history has taught us, we ought to know by now. We can't trust a bunch of politicians to rule our life. No, you've got to trust God. God's never let me down. He's always been faithful. With heads bowed and eyes closed today, I want you to hear these final words. The devil likes it. When you're walking in discontentment. If you're living by the ways of this world, friend, you will soon find yourself living as a malcontent. Disgusted, disappointed, so distracted that you're not really serving God and walking by faith. But that's not the will of God for you. The truth is, every one of us here need to understand a relentless pursuit of Christ what we need to do. That's where we need to be leaning. We need to lean hard into the arms of Christ. And so as we've given this message today, I ask you as an individual believer in Christ, with heads bowed, please, just out of respect of what the Holy Spirit is doing. And how is it in your life right now as a Christian? Are you living in contentment? Yes, I know you've made a confession of faith in Christ. You say, I love Jesus. I know he's forgiven me of my sins. I'm doing my best to serve him. But right now, are you walking in the supernatural power of contentment? If you're not, I invite you as a person of faith to take a step by faith and join me in these altars. I think it'd be good for some of us just to humble ourselves, to kneel in an altar of prayer and look to the Lord Jesus. Say, Jesus, I, I, I love you and I need you to help me. I have forsaken my way. I, I've not been relentlessly pursuing you. Instead, I've been going hard into the things of this world. But I know I can trust you. And I ask you now to help me get back to that reality of living by faith. If the prayer team would come. Maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, I'm not right. I'm not a Christian. Or maybe you'd say, instead of I'm not a Christian, you say, I used to be a Christian. I'm, I'm a backslider. I, I'm not really a Christian right now. Friend, there's a prayer team up here waiting on you. They want to pray with you. You can commit your life to Christ today. Once and for all, you can settle this matter. You don't have to live in discontentedness. Instead, you can trust God with your
your salvation. You can trust God who wants to forgive you of your sins and restore you to a supernatural life. It's possible. It's very possible. You can have it today. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. If you need salvation today, come to the Lord. If you don't know how to pray and receive the Lord and get right, repent of your sins, come to one of these prayer team members. They'll pray with you. And you can leave today with confidence that all is right between you and the Lord. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. Let's look to the Lord today. and special about when we come together with the family of God and believe God and pray and trust Him and cast all of our cares upon Him. Listen, you can trust Him. If you're in need of prayer today for any need in your life, maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ. Maybe you need to cast some cares upon Him because you've been trying to carry some stuff that's just too heavy for you. Okay? Let's pray together. Let's trust the Lord. And so what is Savior
excess ways of this world and sinned against you. I know that I cannot save myself. Jesus, I believe you are the eternal Son of God who died on the cross shedding your sinless blood for my sins and rose from the dead for my new life. By faith, I receive your forgiveness for my sins and the free gift of eternal life. I trust you as my Savior because you are my Lord. I commit to turning away from my sins and living according to your righteous ways. And I commit to growing as a contented follower of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's give him praise today. Glory to his name. If you know you've committed your life to Christ or you've recommitted, please let us know by filling out the Connect card and turning that in today. We look forward to helping you with your next steps. Pastor Jerry, come and take us home today. I say it's a wonderful message, isn't it? And it's hard to be content. It's hard to be content because we, we see so much in this world. We realize Christ is, a, is all we need. Let us go to prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for the message from your word, Lord, that our pastor has brought to us, Lord, to, to help us all to be content with the lives you have given us, Lord. Lord, what sometimes what we see that you've called us to do, we feel not, like is not enough, Lord. But, Lord, what you have called us to do is enough, Lord. Whether it be for one man or woman or one child, Lord, it's to lead them into salvation, Lord. That is enough. That is what you've called us to do. And you will give us other things other than that, greater things as we go along, as we obey your word, Father. Now, Lord, I pray a blessing on each every man, woman, and child at this, at this gathering today, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Keep them safe and bring them back again in your name, we pray. Hallelujah. Amen.